Oh, okay, good. So I can take over this task. Okay, good. So I can then, can um, I can just uh, be focus on my wine. <laughs> we are, we've gone live on YouTube now, so that means we've started. Okay. What? Shola, is there some kind of joint moderating function between between you and me? Uh, not, because, not really. Because now it's again the situation that people are in the waiting room and I, I don't see the blurb to let them in. And yesterday I could let them in kind of immediately. Oh. Maybe because that the people I okay, already let, let allowed in. I've let those that were written in. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, yes, such Okay, so we'll, we'll just give uh, people maybe two minutes and then we start. So welcome everyone. Um, we're just gonna have two minutes and then we'll start. Hey, um, welcome everyone. Can, can everyone hear me? Great, thank you. All right, so welcome to the second day of our, our, our symposium, our virtual symposium. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, um, just wanted to give you some uh, big, a, a bit of background to the African Theatre Association. So for those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome. To those of you that joined us yesterday, we really appreciate that you're, you're able to make it back today. Uh, my name is uh, Kene Iguono. I'm the president of the African Theatre Association. And today we're going to be having uh, Dr. Shala Demi in conversation with uh, Dikwo Oladikwo Agboloaje. Um, before I go on to introduce um, our speakers for today, um, like I said, I want to give us a brief background to the African Theatre Association, if I can get this thing to work. Just give me a minute. Um, the people waiting in the waiting room. All right. So, so um, just to say that um, this event is being recorded live. So it's it's being uh, recorded live on YouTube. So people can actually view this on our YouTube on the African Theatre Association YouTube channel. Uh, the recording is going to be available after this event as well. So please, um, if you have objection to being recorded, please can I suggest that you switch off your video so that you do not show in the in the recordings. Uh, so thank you very much for that. At the end of the symposium today, we're going to be showing um, a 15 minute clip of the African Women uh, Playwrights Network, uh, who are in partnership with the African Theatre Association, uh, so that you can find out a bit more about that. Yesterday, we were able to show the trailer, the two minute trailer, but today we're gonna be showing the 15 minute uh, film. So I, I hope you will stay to sit, watch that as well. Right at the end of the um, in conversation, before the video, we are going to play a, a, a very short survey I think it's got six or seven questions. So please I encourage you to complete that survey on uh, Zoom. It's just six clicks uh, literally and you're done. So please do that. And um, one more thing, uh, please can I uh, plead with everyone to make sure that your uh, mics are on mute 
are muted. Um, if you have questions, I encourage you to ask your questions as we go along, not at the end. And one way to ask your questions as we go along is to type your questions in the chat um, window. When you type that question, the question will come to me as the host and I will send it to um, Dr. Shola and Dr. Abuloaje, and they will be able to respond to your questions. Um, unfortunately, you will not be able to chat with your friends, so you may see some of your friends in the videos, you won't be able to chat with them, um, but you can chat with me, so do send your questions to me and your comments to me as well. Um, that's all I need to say in terms of housekeeping, you know where the toilets are. Um, if you want, if you need to get some water before we start, please grab some water, um, then we're going to start. This event is uh, built to take just um, about uh, two hours. So we should finish just about two hours. So do bear with us. Okay, so let me share the screen and then we, off we go. All right, so like I said, I'm the president of the association. I'm also uh, in my day job, uh, deputy dean for uh, research and knowledge exchange at the uh, Middlesex University within the Faculty of Arts and Creative Industries. So um, after, in many ways, uh, was a child of necessity. Um, after was founded in 2006. Um, actually, uh, Shola, Deepo, and myself, we are founding members of this association, but the founding president um, is Professor Osita Okabwe, who is a, a professor of theater and performance at Goldsmith University. It's an international membership organization that is open to scholars and practitioners of African theater and performance. And our mission is to help to redefine and shape African theater uh, scholarship and pedagogy by liberating it from what we perceived then to be a bondage to non-African non discursive frameworks. So the objectives of AFTA is uh, to facilitate the exploration and communication of African theater and performance traditions, processes, and practices through our conferences, events, and publications. So this symposium we are having today is part of that uh, objective, fulfillment of the objective. Um, after, like most other organizations, are governed by the constitution and bylaws, and they are, we've got two primary bodies. So the executive board, which I chair as the president, and the general assembly, which is made up of the executive board and all members of the association. The general assembly meets once a year, and actually tomorrow is our annual general meeting at the same time at four o'clock. So if you're a member of after listening to me, do make sure you uh, log into that. Uh, the assistant general secretary had already sent information out uh, with the link to join that meeting. If you have not received that link, please get in touch with, um, with us and we'll send that uh, information to you. You can get in touch with the membership secretary mm -hmm. at membership at African theater, african-theater.org. And um, Annette will be able to send that joining link to you. So it, the email address again is membership at african-theater.org. So our membership is open, like I said, to every anyone, actually I say open to people and any Africanist. So um, whether you are a scholar, whether you're a practitioner or even students as well, um, it's really about really helping to pro uh, uh, project African theater worldwide globally. Membership runs from January to December and we have two main categories of membership. We have the general membership uh, which has a subscription rate of 60 pounds per annum for anyone based in the global, global north. If you're based, if you're from the global north, so from the African continent or the Caribbean, uh, it's half, which is 30 pounds. If you're a student based in the global north in Europe, America and co, it's 20 pounds per annum. And if you're based in Africa or the Caribbean, it is 10 pounds. And you can join via our website at africantheaterassociation.org. So this is, I'm not gonna go through all the list of uh, executive board members, but this is the, um, shows you uh, uh, the executive board members as currently constituted. Um, so on the left, you will see the executive officers. So we have five executive officers, uh, which is made up of president, vice president, general secretary, treasurer and the membership secretary. So these are people that run the day-to-day -day 
of the association. And then you have the other members of the executive board, uh, which you find on the right. So um, after, like I said, it was started in 2006. And in 2006, when we started, we felt that our inaugural symposium should be focused on women in African theater and performance. So it's no surprise that as an African Theater Association, we are partnering uh, the African Women Playwrights Network because we recognize that within our discipline, women are often not as represented as they should be at every level, actually, um, which is often not reflective of um, the, the makeup of our student body. Um, this inaugural symposium was hosted at Goldsmith University uh, in 2006, April 2006. And then consequently, we had the first conference in 2017. So I'm not going to read each individual conference, but you can see that in 2017, we had our first conference. In 2018, the, uh, 2008, so seven and eight, there was no conference in 2008, uh, because as a young association, we are still trying to find our feet about so many things. We returned with our annual conferences in 2009, and all the way uh, we've had uh, conferences every year since then, except this year, of course. Now, our conferences alternate between the Global North and Africa. So if, if you look at that, you see that most uh, we've had in 2009 in Northampton. In 2010, we went to Uganda. In 2011, we came to Swansea in UK. In 2012, we went to uh, South Africa. So we try as best as we can to alternate between the Global South and uh, and um, Africa, the global um, north. Um, so it, we also went back to the global north in America in 2015, and then to Abuja in Nigeria in 2016. So you will see that, of course, because of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we've not had any conference this year. Um, in its place, we are having this uh, virtual symposium, which we hope is going to become an annual affair at a different point in the year. So our next conference is going to happen in or the, from the 15th of July to the 17th of July 2021, and that's going to be at the Humboldt uh, University in Berlin. So the, the theme of that conference is Aging, Old Age and Disability in African and African Diaspora Performance, Fame and Festival. Uh, so please, um, because people already submitted abstracts for the conference this year, so this theme is actually the one from this year that we're carrying over to next year. Um, those that already submitted abstract need not resubmit, but for those that are interested in joining the conference in 2021, so we encourage you to please submit your abstract and the information about how to do that can be found on our website. Um, we also have the African Performance Review, which is our journal which is a peer reviewed journal that is published twice a year. Uh, and we welcome submissions to that journal as well. And this is a, a cross section of participants from the 2018 conference. And so that's all I wanted to say. I know uh, you may have a bit more question to ask me about uh, after, please do ask those questions either by emailing myself, the, uh, my email address is president at African Theatre African slash African slash no, what what was it African hyphen theater dot org yeah so thank you very much for that I'm going to uh, hand over to uh, Dr Shala to introduce the quote but before I do that let me uh, tell you who Dr Shala is and I'm going to spotlight him so that you see who we're talking about right. so that's Dr Shala Demi on your screen Dr Shala Demi is the proprietor of Alpha Crowns Publishing Limited. And he publishes academic books of African research and African researchers yeah, and authors. He lectures at Goldsmith University of London, and is a visiting lecturer at University of Bedford, UK. His research are in world theatres and performance studies, particularly the work of Nigerian playwright Femi Oshofiso, intercultural performances, avant-garde performance, contemporary British theatre, post-colonial literature and African studies and diasporic African and Black African theater in its exploration of the politics of identity on the British stage. Dr. Demi has recently completed a monograph on Femi of Oshofiso titled, Vision of Change in African Drama, 
deconstructing identity. What's the problem? Bring up the other hand, the, 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 the response. Please, can you make sure you mute your mic? I'm getting um, some interruption. Uh, so the title of the book again is called uh, Vision of Change in African Drama, Deconstructing Identity and Reconfiguring History. That was published in 2019. Currently, he's working on another uh, book again, which is titled Dramatizing the post colony Nigerian Drama and Theater, Comedy and Satire in African Theater, and a general reader, which is another, he's very busy man he is, a general reader on Femi Oshofi for Carolina, Carolina, uh, Carolina Academy Press, USA. He is also the editor of Okwanifa Review, a literary chapbook. Reviews, he's also the review editor of African Theater. He's a contributing editor of 3, 3P Plus, International Journal of the Arts, and an editorial board member of African Book Link. Dr. Shola Demi is currently the treasurer of the African Theatre Association. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome once again. It's my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Shola Demi. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, before I introduce uh, Dipo, I'll let some of his work uh, introduce him first. Shola, please, uh, can you check your volume? It's a bit low. Hello, Shola, are you there? Yes. Can, can you see? Yeah, but you've not started the slides. It started. No, we can see the um, your folder. Oh, OK. So maybe stop the sharing and start again. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll use PowerPoint. Yes. So okay. instead of the thing, I'll use PowerPoint. So this, this is just to introduce uh, some of the work of uh, Deeper. Your PowerPoint is not open, yes. It is open here. So close it and start again because it's not open on the shared screen. Or maybe stop sharing, stop sharing and start okay. again. Okay, so reshare. Share. Yeah, yeah is it sharing? Go. Perfect. Right, Oladipo Agbolu Aje is a Nigerian British playwright who aesthetically represents, represents Africa on the British stage as an outsider in the mainstream of British theatricality. With plays such as uh, The Estate and Iyale, The First Wife, Agbolu Aje reconstructs the Nigerian social and political system transforming the alienation of the society into a satire of the middle class, acknowledging or reflecting the late 20th century African social history and cultural relationships in dramas whose narratives resonate with the post-colonial British audience. Agbo drama crosses the intersection of religion, ethnicity, and cultural issues, creating spaces of cultural and political haunting where the past and present are interrogated contextually. Oladipo Agboluaje was born in London. He went to Nigeria as a young boy where he attended Abeokuta Grammar School before going on to read for a BA in theater arts at the University of Benin because he said, I wanted to be away from Yoruba land and learn more about Nigeria. And because I was fascinated by the Obership institution among the Edo people. He returned to London where he did an MA in representation and modernity at the London Metropolitan University, followed by a PhD in African drama at the Open University. He began writing comic books. Actually, he started writing comic, comic books when he was in Nigeria and his brother illustrated all these comic books. So, but when he came back to London, to England, he continued writing comic books and also started writing 
uh, poetry and short stories. His first play, Early Morning, was produced in 2003 at the Overhouse Theater to be followed by a string of original plays, adaptations, and radio plays. He has taught creative writing and post-colonial theater and literatures at the London Metropolitan University, Florida State University, the London campus, Goldsmith College, City University, and University of Greenwich, all in London. He has been a writer in residence at New World Sea Theater, Soho Theater, and the National Theater of Great Britain. He was also a research fellow at the Interweaving Performance Center in Berlin, Germany. His plays have been performed in Nigeria, Ghana, France, Brazil, and the United States. He's a winner of the Alfred Fagan Prize for Playwriting and is a nominee for an Olivier Award and a Writers Guild Award. Finally, he's a Royal Literary Fund Fellow. His plays include Mother Courage, The Christ of Cold Double Lane, The Hounding of David Oluwale, which is an adaptation of Kester Asp uh, Aspden's uh, book, Nationality Wog, about the life and death of David Oluwale, presented at the West Yorkshire Playhouse and elsewhere in the UK in 2009. He also wrote The Garbage King, God is a DJ, and New Nigerians. Others include Threshold, uh, Obele and the Storyteller, and Immune for, for children, for youth. His radio play includes Say Goodbye Twice, and that was on BBC Radio 3 in 2010. Today, in a relaxed uh, conversation, we're going to explore his role in unmasking racial injustice and the anguish of terror in our society through its adaptation of The Hounding of David Oluwale, the implications of an African writer practicing in the UK in the age of Black Lives Matter, African theatre practices and the pedagogy, including the use of language in a hostile environment, the politics of writing science fiction for the stage in Immune and Threshold, and the future of theatre in post-COVID-19 environment, among other topics. Welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Now, um, let's start with you, Oladipo Agulwaje. What kind of writer are you? Um, well, I consider myself to be a, a satirist and, um, and also a political writer, um, political in terms of personal and in terms of interrogating structural issues relating to race and class uh, and gender. Um, I've, I've always enjoyed uh, looking at the world with a, a slight satirical bent. I, I, I actually always think that that's more to do with me being a Nigerian than anything else. Um, I've always seen a uh, uh, in, in Nigeria, we say you don't have to you don't have to turn on your TV to see drama. You just have to look outside your window. Um, and particularly for those who lived in Lagos, I think that was uh, very true. It was I think Lagos was a 24 hour news channel before CNN. Um, so uh, that that's what I consider myself as um, political and satirical. OK. Um, you wrote um, your play about David Oluwale, the Nigerian uh, immigrants to Britain, to Leeds in the 50s and 60s on the general issue of racial justice. The role of the artist in unmasking the anguish of terror in the society and how black people were portrayed and depicted at that time. How did the commission come about? Can you tell us a bit more about the play and then tell us what pickled your creative interest, especially about the story of David Oluwale? Yes, well, I um, originally, I, I remember I walked mm -hmm. into a bookshop uh, in Charing Cross in London, in central London, and uh, there was a power display of this book. Um, and it, I, I, what attracted me to it first was the offensive title 
nationality wog, uh, the hounding of David Oluwale. And the second thing that attracted it, uh, me to it, because I, I normally heard of, you know, the names like Olawale or Uluwale. I'd never heard of uh, Uluwale. So I assumed it might have been the author not doing his research and just writing his name, writing the name of a, a person. As, as most of us who are from uh, other parts of the world in the UK know, we've, we, the, the way our names have been um, massacred, you know, in, 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 in print and in uh, a, a dialogue. It's something that, you know, it, it's a continual issue. So I assume that that was what was uh, another, this was another variation of it. Um, and then I read the blurb and I thought, well, it's an interesting book, but I wouldn't buy it just yet. I'd, I'd wait for it to come out in paperback uh, when it would be a bit cheaper. And then the following week, I got a phone call from the West Yorkshire Playhouse asking me if I would like to uh, adapt a play for them, which would tour nationally. But if they couldn't get a tour, it would still go on at the West Yorkshire Playhouse because it was a story of local interest. I then asked them what was the title of the book and they said it was uh, The Hounding of David Oluwale. Um, and I remember laughing because, and then them asking me why, why what, what did I find funny? And I said to them, well, you've just saved me about 15 pounds because uh, now I don't need to buy the book. And they posted it to me. And I read it almost immediately. And I remember being furious at the fact that A, I didn't know about this story, and B, uh, the tragic consequences of a fellow Nigerian uh, in the 1960s. Um, the story of David Oluwale is that he is a person, uh, a young man who left Nigeria in the 1940s to England to work. And he had high hopes of becoming an engineer. And then um, through a series of misfortunes, he got into trouble uh, with the police. And it, on one particular encounter, he got uh, injured. Uh, he was hit on the head uh, with, with a police truncheon, which led him to have mental problems. And so he was sectioned in an asylum for about eight years. And when he came out, he became homeless. Uh, uh, roaming the streets. Later on, he became targeted by two police officers um, at the time when Leeds was undergoing a, a massive uh, uh, reconstruction of the city center. And the police at that time, one of their main jobs was to make sure that they removed all homeless people off the streets. And David at the time was one of the few, if not the only, sorry, black uh, uh, vagrant. But he was targeted by two police officers, and later on, uh, in 19, around 1968, 69, he died, uh, presumed drowned in the major river in Leeds, the River Eyre. Um, as a consequence of that, the, the two police officers were charged uh, with his uh, causing his death, and they were sentenced to jail. Um, and they were sentenced to jail in 1971. And since then, they have been the, this has been the only time that the police have been held responsible for the death of a black man. That's interesting. Thank you very much for that, Vivian. Now, what is, in, what is the importance? What do you think is the importance of not just the play, but the, the scenario, the, the story, the narrative of Oluwale in the Britain of today? You know, what, what do you regard as the most enduring relevance okay, in this age of Black Lives Matter? Well, particularly looking at it in today's, uh, 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 as you said, in, uh, thinking about it in light of Black, black Lives Matter, I, I think it's, it's, it's very important. One of the main issues I think that uh, crops up in terms of David Oluwale is justice. Um, the fact that he has been the only a black person who has died in police custody that has received justice. I, I think that is the main issue for me. Um, it's easy for us to talk about, you know, reconciling and reforming the, the police, but without a, a, a sense of justice, we, we you know, uh, black people seem to fall under 
uh, the, when it comes to law and order, then it, it is mostly applied to black people. But when we think of justice, that is another thing. Um, David received uh, justice in, and that was way back in 1971, but there were also other circumstances that led to him receiving justice. The fact that the two policemen had already been fired for uh, uh, an offense that they had committed. They, they, they ran over a, an elderly woman and killed her. And then they falsified the report in their notebook. Uh, they, they falsified their, their official reports and they were found out and they were fired. So for most of the police, it seemed a case of that the, the police officers were expendable uh, more than the fact that uh, David uh, 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 re received justice. In fact, if not for the efforts of a, a police officer, the, the detective who came down from London, uh, that was brought in from London to investigate the case, it, it might have been shoved under the carpet. So for me, for now, I think what, what people particularly around the world are demanding is justice. Um, that equal treatment under the law, equal treatment by the police. And, and that for me, I think is what's very important about David, uh, the, 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 the story of David is very much a person who was looked down upon society because he was poor, because he was homeless and because he had mental problems. So there you can see sort of the intersections of race and class defining uh, 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 David. Um, he was a person because of his condition was unable to speak for himself. And that was one of the things that the, the, the play does. Uh, and it, 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 it asks that we, uh, everybody under the law, everybody who belongs or is a citizen of a, of a country, it, whether they're citizen or not, deserves justice. Okay. Now let, let's, let's, let's move a little bit again, Charlie. Let's talk about identity. You know, um, we have all these terms and terminologies nowadays, black, black, British, uh, BIM, people of color, etc. In fact, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, your fellow Brixtonian, B. Bandele states that he feels uncomfortable being bracketed as a black playwright. Like at that time, he was uh, about the most visible uh, one uh, in Britain. He said, I think of myself as completely sui generis. You know? And uh, so many other writers on the, on the African continent have always said they, they refuse this idea of label of being identified because it's uh, gives a preconceived idea about the people, about the writing. But for you, what, what is your position on the issue of identity and terminology? You know, is it, is it relevant or does it make any difference at all if, if a writer is identified by ethnicity or by their art? Um, well, I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a shorthand uh, but, but it can also be an imposition. And I guess it depends on how you define uh, what these terms are. Uh, we remember that blackness in Britain, particularly in the 70s and 80s, was a political term to define people, not just uh, people who are not white, but also people who are in the periphery of power. So um, it, 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 and, and as you said, you know, uh, over the years, we've, we, they've had all these issues of how to define us. Um, but we haven't defined ourselves. You know, it, it's uh, power defining us, the system defining us. Um, at one point we were BME before they decided, uh, which was uh, black and minority ethnic. And they thought, oh, we need the, a we forgot, oh God, we forgot the Asians, quick. So then they changed it to BAME to include the Asians. And I, I once wrote, I, I, I wrote on Facebook that the real reason why they changed it from BME to the AME is because a lot of us writers thought BME meant beginning, middle, and end. So we, we it, it, it's the terms. I mean, I think most writers just would regard. I think Roy Williams, the British black British playwright, would say uh, he always says, "I don't mind what you call me, so long as you don't forget writer." And that's how I see myself. I think uh, uh, as writers. You know, we, we, we deal with identity, we deal with self-definition. I, you know, I've always defined myself, for instance, say, as British Nigerian. 
uh, not Nigerian British, you know, um, <laughs> but because that's only what defines the cultures that I come from, you know, uh, and the influences on 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 my writing. So um, I, I I I can't escape the fact that I was born in England. I can't escape the fact that I was I went to Nigeria. Um, I can't escape the fact that I was so glad that I went to Nigeria and I came and I, that I lived there for for long. That I studied. That I learned all the cultures and the influences that uh, I had that have made me the writer that I am today. Um, I, I always go by the, uh, the, the line in, in Tennyson's Ulysses that I am a part of all that I have met, you know. Um, so for me, labels, you know, uh, they, they, it's always other people defining us, you know, mm. but we, uh, for, but you also have black people defining themselves for instance, now there's a movement, you know, African American movements who are thinking maybe African doesn't define us as such because now there are many people from the continent who are coming, uh, you know, uh, abroad, uh, coming over to America. So these definitions are contingent; they're shifting, and a lot of it is to do with culture and with circumstance, as well as uh, and not just uh, about power. So um, for me, you know. So long as you, I'm, I'm like Roy Williams, so long as you don't forget to call me a, a writer, uh, you can write whatever, you know, whatever you like. Mm. Uh, but for me, I, I, I'm a writer, I'm a playwright, and that's it. Begin, middle, end. Leave it to a satirist to defend that. Now, l l actually, when, when you were introducing yourself, when I, or when I asked the question, what kind of writer you are, you said you are, um, you are, are you, see yourself as as a satirist so let's let's talk satire um you once stated that your influences include the works of uh, yoruba practitioners such, such as uh ayogushino known as papa lulu uh, tajudin badamosi uh, jacob and uh, kadi olaya aderupoko who were very popular uh, on nigerian television in the 80s with their Jester's International Group. Um, who have this uh, influenced your writing? And were they the only people who influenced your satiric bent? Uh, well, they, they, as you said, they, they were the major ones, but there were also the other, uh, other popular uh, uh, um, uh, Yoruba uh, comedians, uh, such as uh, Moses Olaya, who goes by the name of um, whose stage name is Babasala. Um, there was also the late uh, Gwenga Adeboye who had a, a radio show uh, every morning uh, uh, on La in Lagos that I used to listen to. Um, and all of them, uh, and not just them, but also the, the, the more serious uh, uh, dramas uh, on TV um, influenced me. And one of the reasons uh, why is because um, it wasn't just the, the, the outrageous humor, but what it did was also it let, it let me into the world of how a people think. Because although these were comedies and satires, they were very expressive of the worldview of the people of the Yoruba. And not just that, they weren't just funny, but they always had a moral aspect to them as well. So in a sense, you could see that satire was performing many different functions. Uh, to, to society. And if you, 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 we know what Nigeria was like as a society and most of the pressing issues were around corruption, you know, development, negotiating modernity and all these comedies, these satires dealt with them. And they dealt with them not in a heavy handed way but in a very artistic way. And in a way that I, I um, th they were the reason that made me learn Yoruba very quickly because I wanted to know why my father was laughing so loud. He would laugh in, a, in, a, in, in when we'd watch the English comedies, he would laugh and the American comedies, he would laugh in a certain way. But when he would watch the Yoruba comedies, he would laugh in a much more different way that made me think there's something going on here that I, I think I should know about, you know. So, um, and I think he got, also because he got fed up with interpreting uh, what the, because you know, when you, when you interpret a joke, you kill the joke, you know, when you have to tell it, you, know, you explain the joke, you kill it. Yeah. So we were, myself and my brother were spoiling his enjoyment of the, uh, of the, of the dramas. So we quickly had to learn uh, uh, Yoruba because of that. 
Um, but also there was the, the, the um, throughout sort of my education, um, when we went secondary school, uh, that's when I first encountered Wale Shoyinka's The Trials of Brother Jero and Jero's Metamorphosis. Uh, when we're in university, I was uh, in the uh, one of the, the groups uh, that performed uh, Femi Oshofison's Midnight Hotel. Um, it was one of the funniest uh, uh, comedies and satirical takes on Nigerian society. Um, and so because I wanted to comment on society, I wanted to comment on contemporary issues, uh, watching those comedies on TV, watching uh, reading those plays, uh, I think those just sort of got me in the in the frame of mind to say yes, this is exactly uh, what I want to do. And uh, another one that I also really really loved was a, a TV program called uh, Masquerade, with the the, the main character Chief uh, Zebudaya. That was another uh, uh, comedy, four thirty. Uh, four thirty years. That was another comedy that uh, influenced me greatly. Now we, we we can't talk about your the, your satire without really talking about your language, you know. Uh, most people who read your play and who watch your play always comment about the language because you don't write in the standard Queen's English. Rather, you write in the satiric language that is infused with Pidgin English, with Yoruba English, which is one of the reasons why people think uh, or bring uh, critically bring out the uh, Yali and the estate directed by Femi Lufoji Jr. Uh, because of the uh, way it brought out that Yoruba essence and the Nigerian essence out of your work. How do you, what do you think, I mean, how do you say to the, uh, Reason that your use of language is it's it's uh, enriched by the metacritical Yoruba language. Well, um, I think because I, I when I think of the characters, um, I think very much in terms of uh, how they would actually speak. And when I write, when I think of uh, devising a story. Uh, whether it's in the UK, you know, anywhere else, I, I always ask myself, you know, what would be the most ideal audience? And of course, the audience, ideal audience for a play like that would be a Nigerian audience. Yeah. And that's one of the good things about being in London is like there are so many of us here, uh, you know. Um, so I, I, I it, but an another critical thing is that. Um, when you're negotiating with theatres, you know, you have dramaturgs, you've got directors, you've got literary managers, and most of their focus is on their audience. And of course, when they're sort of assisting you in shaping a play, uh, the first thing on their mind is, is the audience. But the first thing on my mind as a writer is to uh, all extents and purposes, uh, and I know it's a troubled, it's a, it's a, 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 a term that, uh, is um, debate has been debated upon is authenticity. And I've always said uh, uh, to people that sometimes when you as a non-British, uh, a non-British uh, person trying to write about your story is that you can, when uh, depending on the venues you encounter, it could be like writing with one hand tied behind your back and you almost feel like you're a translator. And then you realize that there are certain dramatic terms or uh, phrases that you would use that have meaning, that uh, create metaphor and resonance that you would, you know, uh, uh, you, you would uh, expand on later yep. on in the drama, you might not be able to, because what you would hear is the venue saying things like, yes, we get it, but our audience won't get it. And so one of the great things of working with uh, Femi Elifowoju Jr. and his company Theatre Fancy at the time, was that here was a director who was from the same culture, who, like me, born in England, went to Nigeria, uh, learned and studied drama in Nigeria. So we shared the same references. So all we needed really was the confidence to put on a show, uh, awesome. you know, that uh, 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 we could sell to uh, an, an audience. And with the estates, uh, that, that was performed in Soho Theatre. And I remember the looks on the Soho Theatre management 
when I sent them the first draft because they couldn't make head or tail of it. I mean, they were like, first, it's like, everybody's calling themselves auntie, uncle, and brother, you know, are they all related? I was like, no, they're not. Um, but, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, you can't talk to an older person, you know, uh, uh, call them by their name. And they'd be like, but our audience won't get this. And I said, well, the good thing is we're in London. You know, if you go to Peckham, I'm sure you can find a few Nigerians to fill the audience. Um, so um, it, it, I, 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 I want to bring out uh, 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 the whole three-dimensional nature of the characters. And I can't do that if I truncate or I adapt the, or, or translate the language and the concepts, because it's like, hold, it's like a Formula One driver making pit stops to refuel, to explain what a term means. Yeah. But what I try and do is to show that in the drama, to let those things play out in the drama. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it, it was great that, as I said, having somebody like Femi Oluforge, who had been working for years with his company, Theatre Fancy, to say, okay, there are one or two things that I think now, you know, I think, yeah, uh, I, you know, I, we, we can't do this. We've got to find a way. <laughs> okay, yes. look, okay, you want it, fine. Let's find a dramatic way of doing it. Let, 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 let's, how, how, you know, let's get the actors in, let's perform it and let's see. Um, and it worked. Uh, fortunately, um, it, it, it worked, out, certainly with the estate. And when we went on to do Iyali, uh, we even went further. That's good. Now, um, I'm going to move on to uh, uh, Threshold, your sci-fi, you know, because you, 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 are, you are an eclectic writer. You not only write political satires or social satires, you write for children, you write for youth, you write uh, a sci-fi. You, you... Now, let's talk about Threshold. Now, Threshold is a, well, it's a thriller. I would say it's a thriller, but it's an adaptation of uh, Imos Tutola's The Pawan Drinkard. It's set in Nigeria and in the spirit world, which is a metaphor, you know, for outside Nigeria. It also has characters who are described as Nigerian American, British, American, comic world denizens. And now, when you were conceiving this play, did you conceive that spirit world for the diaspora, for African diaspora, or for something else? So tell us first of all why well, something about that threshold, why it came about, and then your interpretation of that spirit world, and maybe you can link it to your idea of Afro Afropolitanism. Yeah. Well, um, thresh. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, by the way, this is this is a picture from the from the production at Richmond University yeah. in 2014 yes. that yeah. you did, and the uh, Jumo Gumbe. Did the music directed by Chuck Mike? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, um, well, Threshold was we, we was first conceived for a London diasporic audience, um, and so uh, Chuck Mike came down from the University of Richmond, and I worked with Joao uh, Gungwe on the music uh, to create a, as you said, an, a, a, a modern day adaptation of a Amos Tutuola's The Palm Wine Drinkard. Um, but funny enough, I'd say I was actually much more inspired by Wale Inka's Dance of the Forests. But it, it does follow the line of a, a comic book character by the name of Kunle, who creates this comic book called Threshold. Um, and he's also formed a group of uh, three Palm wine uh, drinkers, a drink, a palm wine drinkers club. The Alaringo players. The uh, called yes, called the Alaringo players later on. Uh, so and but what they don't realize is that Kunle, uh, you know, a, a guy who studied and lived most of his life abroad, uh, trying to reconnect with his culture, uh, decided uh, why he hires them, why why he drinks with them is because he takes their stories without telling them and uses them to create this comic book called Threshold. Um, 
So later on, uh, he, he, he gets into uh, a trouble because A, he refuses to share credit with the, uh, with the artist uh, who draws the, his stories um, and also has issues with his father who wanted him to become a, a lawyer and inherit the law firm. But anyway, halfway through, the, 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 the three uh, palm wine drinkers discover that he has been uh, stealing their stories. Yeah. And um, they they go after him. Um, so he he inclined. I forgot to add that he also likes drinking palm wine and thinks that palm wine is the source of his inspiration. And so he's deep in the forest trying to get palm wine from his regular palm wine tapper, who has uh, is in mourning for the love of his life, who has passed away. And he's up a palm wine tree, and the the PJ uh, the the Alaringo players send him up the palm wine tree to go and get it. And the, the palm wine tree then becomes a portal to the spirit world uh, where he goes on this adventure to try and retrieve his palm wine tapper. So you can see sort of similarities with uh, the source material, uh, the palm wine drinker. Yeah. Um, along the way, he encounters characters from his stories. And in, in, in his original story, in his comic book story, he has uh, actually physically killed all the Yoruba deities. Um, so he, 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 he has killed all the Yoruba deities and there's a consequence of that in that world. Uh, and so that world is being erased. It's being erased culturally and materially. And in a sense, he sees a vision of a Nigeria without any, without any of the Yoruba spirituality. Um, so when he gets to the end of the, of the road of his journey, the palm wine drinkard uh, has taken his lover from the world of the dead. And he tries to, and tries to bring her back to the world of the living, which is forbidden. Uh, so in the end, uh, what, what we, I don't want to give away the ending. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. I, I won't, I, I'll sort of leave, yeah, the story. We'll wait until it's published. Yeah. yeah but, but, but the question, the reading actually of, of this play is that Kunle is a sort of a person who now serves as an agent of appropriation of Africanness. You know, by taking all these stories from the Alaringo player. And Kunle is not a fully, I mean, uh, uh, of, well, not, not fully. It's not fully honest with them. It's not actually honest with them at all, which is a sort of how we read Africans who are in the diaspora, who are sort of losing their ideals, losing their narratives, yeah. losing their identity to others, in quote, who take this, their essence, the essence of their identity, their narratives, without actually giving them credit, you know? So now, do you think this, this kind of production or the function of the diaspora uh, is, is a way of trying to recuperate the Africanness or in what you, you sometimes uh, interpret, sometimes your, your uh, reason or your definition of Afropolitanism? Mm. Yes, um, that's true because uh, part, part of the story, of course, is that there's a, a, a critique of Afropolitanism. Um, I remember reading one critic saying, well, um, it's always interesting that in Africa, we always have to create our own terms for phenomena that is global and that there was already a, a term that exists, which is cosmopolitanism. But also Afropolitanism seems to refer to a term uh, directed to a certain group of people, yeah. sort of from the you know, 90s, late 90s, 2000s onwards, uh, a very middle class, uh, a, a, a global African. And doesn't take in the fact of the other uh, 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 groups, uh, uh, refugees, um, uh, economic migrants, um, uh, and also we mustn't forget, particularly the economic migrants, or uh, say in the UK, who've actually changed the demographic in in the eighties and nineties. Um, if you remember that, uh, in Nigerians started coming to the UK and to the uh, and to the US in droves, and Andrew, sort of Andrew checking out. Andrew, yes, the, the, in nineteen eighties, there was actually it got to a point where the government had to uh, uh, create an advert begging Nigerians to stay at home, to stay in Nigeria, you know? So 
it, 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 that period too has sort of, that group of people has seemed to be excluded from that term, Afropolitanism. And so well, what I was trying to do in, 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 in uh, Threshold was also to interrogate that notion, that idea of Afropolitanism. And it goes back to what you said earlier about uh, when we were talking about BME and BAME, yeah. about whether these terms are limiting in, in how we use them to describe ourselves. So that for me was uh, 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 one of the things that, yes, that was very utmost on my, on, on, on my mind. Kunle, as you said, is representative of a certain global uh, 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 African who is, you, you can see, the, uh, you know, um, fashion, arts, uh, uh, the, the visual, the specular aspect of, of uh, Afropolitanism. But where does it come from? It comes from the, 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 the roots. And, and part of his uh, problem is because he hasn't uh, uh, been honest. It's more to do with his dishonesty in, in his relationship with the Alarian Joe players of you know, appropriating their stories uh, and then packaging it for a Western uh, or for a, yes, for a North a global North audience. That was one of the things uh, uh, that, that uh, I was looking at in, in the story. It, there's a scene in the in in the in the studio where you've got the three characters uh, arguing over whether they should take this deal from uh, an American uh, comic book, um, a, a conglomerate like Marvel Comics or DC, and they're arguing over what they uh, whether they should uh, take the deal and sell sell the the, the, the comic um, the company to them. And of course, they're asking them to make certain changes to make it more palatable to a global audience. So you have this debate about, you know, what is African culture and what isn't, you know. Um, so that, that, that and, and of course, bearing in mind that African culture is always, it, it's a fluid, you know, continuous uh, 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 notion. Yeah. But I guess the question was who, was who decides, you know, those. Yes, uh, those, uh, those, those codes, yeah. Yes. Now let's let's um, uh, I think uh, we should we should round up, but let's let's end with uh, with Nollywood. You know, most playwrights uh, of what I'll call the Nigerian heritage or Nigerian extraction have, at one point or the other, in the past 15, 20, 25 years, and here we can mention people like uh, Adiola Sholanke, uh, B. Bandele, uh, Bola Gbaje. Debolua to me, no, uh, and others. They've always produced screenplays for the Nigerian home video and the new Nigerian film industry, popularly called Nollywood. Now, what's, what is your take on Nollywood and when are you going to write for Nollywood or are you going to write for Nollywood at all? Um, I don't know. I, hey, I have to admit, I, I really. I might sound elitist to this, but I love theater. <laughs> I love theater so much that whenever anybody comes to me and says, I've got this project, my mind goes immediately to the stage. That, that's, I visualize the stage immediately. Um, and and the, my first, uh, my take on Nollywood is I, I think it's something that Nigerians should be proud of to have built an industry from the ground up uh, without any government help. In fact, I, I'd argue that in most instances, you know, government has been a hindrance more than a, a, a help. Um, I was actually still living and working in Nigeria when uh, Nollywood was just about to take off. And I used to go for meetings with the copyright, uh, when the, the, the uh, Nigerian Copyright um, uh, I forgot, Commission was just being set up. Yeah, had just been set up. And I used to go for, for, for meetings there. And um, I have to say, you know, it, it, it's it's something that I think we should we should really be proud of. Um, I guess for now it's the direction in which it goes. I mean, a lot of the practitioners have been trying to get government to help to regulate uh, 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 the, uh, the the system so that more revenue can accrue to it, uh, because it loses a lot of money due to 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 piracy. And now we've got it's great. I mean, for some people, it's great that. A, 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 a company like Netflix is looking to invest in in in, in Nigeria. Um, it, it, again, it, it's, uh, I, I've been part of uh, uh, um, meetings and and and, uh, and so on. I, I remember there was one we did at the Open University with um, 
I think Professor Duruni was in attendance as, as well, and um, the later Makaigwe, uh, Anton yes. De Kilani, which I attended a few years, year, I think it was around 2006. So I've always kept a close relationship uh, with, with uh, Nollywood. I think the problem has been the, the right ideas, you know, the right idea, and also the execution of that idea. Um, much as I consider myself to be a satirist, I also, I also, um, uh, but the most important part for me is, is the story, you know, uh, and making sure that that story is constructed properly in a way that people understand uh, the message and the meaning. Um, so I don't want to create something that's just for fun and to make money, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I would like to create something that, you know, and sometimes that can put me at loggerheads with the discussions when I've had debates with Nigerian producers. I, I, I used to go to um, uh, AFRIF, which is the uh, African International uh, Festival. Film Festival. Yeah. Um, I, and, um, and I was a judge at one of those events. And I remember it was, it, <laughs> well, you know, there were, it, the films that were in competition, I, I was a judge for the, the, the full length film, one of the judges. And um, I remember one film that was shown that was, well, it, it, let's just say that, you know, it, it, I, I'm being polite if I say it wasn't the best anyway. But um, what, what went on was that there was a, 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 a Yoruba language film that was really, really, really very good. And all the judges, we were all unanimous in that that film was just the best. And so we gave it best film award. And then um, when the film was announced during the ceremony, um, you could almost hear, a, I think people forgot to clap because they were so shocked. Um, and then we realized that it was that other film that we thought was, you know, not the best that they had expected to win. Um, so, it, it, and this was among filmmakers. So that, that much as I love Nollywood, I feel that there are times when I, I look back to the films of the early 2000s and though they weren't yeah. the best in terms of technical quality, um, their stories, I, I would argue, are probably better than the ones that we're seeing now that have higher production values, um, but seem to be more influenced by, as they, the last time I was there, everybody kept talking about Tyler Perry uh, style yeah. comedies. Yeah. yeah. I think back then when it started out, it was very much more closer to the, to the people to and the stories were much closer to, to the lives that people lived when we consider now. Do you then think now that um, the, the uh, involvement of Netflix is in the right direction? Because you remember just a couple of weeks ago, a more Abu Dhu's Ebony Life, Ebony Life TV has got this Netflix commission to, to adapt while issuing Cars, Death and Kings of Span, and also uh, to do an original series based on the secret lives of Baba Shege's wives by Lola Shunai, which of course, Femi Olufo Oji Jr. adapted for stage. Yeah. Now, do you think, we, although you, you are thinking of going back to the kind of story that was being created in those days, but do you think the involvement of Netflix is going to, is, is in the right direction, is going to encourage this or is going to be an, uh, a, an adverse influence? Well, I think it will encourage uh, people. I think Nigerians, we've always considered ourselves to be a global people. And if you look at the success of Nigerian music, the Nigerian music industry, you know, for instance, um, I think uh, Nigerian filmmakers have always wanted to emulate that success and therefore see Netflix as a channel with which to, to emulate that success. Um, I, I guess it, 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 I think it's great to see, for instance, um, adaptations of Nigerian stories. And I'd hope to see more uh, of, of, of that because the, the Nigerian literary and dramatic heritage is, is immense. It, it's immense and, and a lot of those stories need and deserve to be uh, uh, shown to a wider audience. And I say this bearing in mind when you consider that uh, a play like Wale Shoyinka's Death and the King's Horseman has only been performed twice in the UK and uh, given the fact that he's the first African, Black African uh, Nobel Laureate. And when you consider the amount of uh, major writers in Nigeria who've created uh, uh, incredible work and their works are hardly seen in the UK. 
um, despite the fact that we have so many departments of uh, uh, post-colonial studies and African studies. Um, so um, I, I think if it, if it can create a wider audience and, uh, and, and it can be accessible to on a global audience, then fine. I, I would argue that that success uh, is based on the work of the previous generations of uh, filmmakers and they're, they're distributing, you know, they back then distributing their, their videos on VCDs and on, 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 on videos that, that it is not Netflix that has made Nollywood global. Netflix has just come in at a time, uh, you know, um, people had always been talking about the, the influence of the Nigerian uh, film industry in diaspora for much, for, for, for years, a uh, bit prior to this. Um, but if, if this is the way forward, then, um, but I just feel that the, the, the filmmakers should just be careful in terms of making sure that they cut deals that uh, will benefit them and also uh, benefit the industry as a whole. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Dr. Oladipo Agbuluaje. Um, I, I'm sure we have some questions for you from the from the audience, and probably somebody is going to ask questions on the idea of the coloniality and the modernity that you uh, uh, talked about. Um, for me, my final question for this evening is: When are we going to read the play about Fela? <laughs> oh yes, um, yes, I'd. I'd um... I'd, uh, I can't remember when, but I, I did. I did write a play about uh, Fela Kuti, which was sort of prior to um, prior to Fela the musical. Um, yes. It was uh, set during the um, uh, was it the nineteen seventy seven uh, the invasion of the Kalakuta, uh, yeah, of Kalakuta, the unknown soldier, yeah, unknown soldiers of the Nigerian army. Um, yes, I mean that that is. Um, Actually, last year I did have a, a conversation with uh, a, a company about reviving it, and it was more to do with uh, not getting the funding. That that's what's happened, and then wondering if one sh we should um, rewrite it for a smaller cast because it was meant to be uh, uh, very much like a big a, a page. It was a big yes, it was a big piece, but given the the funding environment, particularly now in the during the COVID nineteen era that might be harder to do, but it is still something that, uh, you know, uh, there is still an ambition to, to complete, yes. Thank you very much, and uh, for this conversation, I'm going to hand over now to uh, uh, Kenna Iguano. So for whether we should take questions now or whether she, he wants to do the AWPM before we take questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dikwo. Thank you. Um, I'm actually not going to be taking over the, uh, <laughs> the, the discussion. Uh, so, Shola, you've got some questions in your chat. Yes. Um, and and I'll, I'll allow you to carry on with those. And oh, then once okay. we've gone through some of those questions, we uh, watch the video. Unless, of course, you want us to do the video now. But I think, I think, no, I, think we, I think we can carry on with the questions while we are still. I think we're on flow. Yeah. Let's carry on. So I'll, I'll pass back to you, Shola, to carry on. You've got some questions in your chat for people already. Okay, so um, Dipo, the first question that you actually have is from, uh, here is from Mabel uh, Everome, uh, Roma, who says, uh, do you interrogate race only from the angle of blackness? Um, not, well, uh, yes, so far. Um, the funny thing is I'm, I'm actually writing a, a play, a, 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 I, I wrote um, uh, a short piece called um, Contagion. That's what it was called, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently for a, a company, it, it's actually online. Uh, I, I think I'll have to provide you the link. It's just a 10 minute short piece um, yeah. and it, it's set in China. Um, I was asked to write a piece about um, COVID-19 related racism against uh, 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 the uh, people of Asian, Southeast Asian origin in the UK. And then later the, the commissioner said, no, actually we'd like you to write something about uh, racism of uh, the Chinese towards Africans in China. 
and so I wrote this again. It's a satirical piece uh, about the difficulties of which, you know, how people define each other uh, in yeah. terms of racial race and class dynamic. So you've got this uh, character again, a sort of a global African, uh, an Afropolitan type character, uh, but actually he's not, uh, uh, but only in name because he's grown up in England all his life. Um, and so he goes to, he works in China and it's, uh, it's a day he encounters uh, 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 um, certain racist aspects towards Africans of say uh, a, a, a lower class or, you know, uh, sorry, Africans from the continent. And in, sorry, you, you were saying something? No, carry on, carry on. Yeah. So, and he, he enters this sort of awkward uh, conversation with them. And that sort of problematizes this issue of whether because we're all black, we all share the same, you know, uh, values, we share the same, uh, 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 or we see the, the world in the same way. So when he gets to his office where he's the only black person, it's all filled with Chinese people. But one of them, uh, the Chinese, per uh, one of his best friend, there is also a diasporan Chinese who has lived and studied in America. And then they have this, uh, uh, enter into this debate uh, which complicates this issue of uh, race and looking at it again uh, away from not just a black white issue. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the few things that we haven't really looked at in, in terms of um, uh, blackness and race with outside of a black white dichotomy. So I, I was trying to do that in, in that regard. Maybe this is actually the, the, the your answer is uh, as a follow up. To, with the, the question, you know, because I think this question from also from Abel is based on your definition of yourself as a, a British Nigerian and so on, and this issue of race. And she asked, what to you then is home or homecoming? Um, Where yeah. is home? Yes, that, that, that's true. Um, I don't know. I actually consider myself to be an in-between uh, character. I've had a lot of discussions about this, um, and I've always said, well, if if for Shoyenka Ogun is his muse, if for Shofisson it's um, is it Obatala? I think Oromila, it, yeah. Oromila, sorry, it's Oromila is his muse. Then for me, I, I think my muse is Ishu, and the reason why an Ishu is the trickster god, you know, is like the Anansis. Well. Nancy is a uh, mythical character, but issue is more of a deity. But I would consider, um, if, if I were to, to consider that, I would say it's issue simply because he's the god of the crossroads. Uh, and I see myself as sort of inhabiting a crossroads, you know, of between two cultures. Uh, I'm a sort of, I see myself sort of being betwixt and between, uh, comfortable in both, uncomfortable in both worlds. Um, so, and it, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's weird because sometimes at the last time I went to uh, America, um, I, I felt more of a European than even say British or Nigerian. And that was simply because a week before I had been in the Netherlands, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it felt weird because I'd never felt that way before. I'd, I'd either see myself as either uh, uh, British or Nigerian or British Nigerian. I mean, when I go home to Nigeria, because I've still kept, because of the the, the uh, sort of technological development in terms of telecommunications and you know, like WhatsApp uh, and 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 um, uh, the internet, I have still kept close relations with family and friends. You know, I'm I'm still a member of my uh, secondary school old boys association. I'm still a member of my university, old uni University of Benin Association. Um, and we, we, uh, we all still communicate with each other. Oh. You, I remember the Nick, we all call ourselves by our nicknames, recalling uh, embarrassing events that took place when we were younger, you know, ever so often on WhatsApp, uh, a, a picture, a photograph pops up of us, you know, Doing, doing a performance of uh, a, 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 a play at University of Benin. So 
that aspect of me never it, it, it's part and parcel of me in the uk okay. and it now, actually be maybe aspect. maybe that question will lead to the third question by um by uh mabel and linking it with a question by chasun wadibwe mabel says as a dramatist how does locality matter to you then this locality that you're describing how does it matter to you in language naming gender place space and charles says that you know we should actually link link this to the the london underground scene you know the idea of the london underground scene as a metaphor does the scene have any reflection of your interest on blackness and identity construction yeah, um yes it it it, it i i guess it, it does i mean for me place is it, it's very important but it, but it, then it depends on which play that I'm writing. For instance, when I wrote Immune, which is a young people's play set in Plymouth, um, I, that, that commission was uh, with three, three venues in three different parts of the UK. And they expected that the play would incorporate all parts of the UK. But when I got to Plymouth, I thought it would be better to set it just in Plymouth, simply because of the locality. Uh, and it's the same when I uh, uh, when I think of say a play like The Estate or Yali, and that's where and that is what drives the language. Yeah. So when I was in Plymouth, I picked working with the young people. I picked up all the slang that young people use, all the language that young people use. Uh, when I did the, the Hounding of David Oluwale, it was quite interesting because it went on a regional tour of the UK. And I remember some of the regional venues that I already had had an association with. I, I, I remember one of the artistic directors in one of those venues saying, oh, we, we didn't think Dikwa was going to write the play in Leeds dialect. And I thought, well, the play is set in Leeds. You know, what, what did you think? Uh, what did you expect? <laughs> what did you expect? And of course, because David Oluwale too speaks in a sort of a, 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 a Yorubanglish register as well. So they were thinking, oh, this is going to be very hard to sell because it's not a local story. And, and that actually points to the fact that um, in terms of audiences and, and venues that regionality is also, we, we, we seem to, uh, 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 when we think of things like that, we, we, we seem to think that these are the things that take place you know, in, in, in Africa, in Nigeria, in India, regionalism, tribalism, and so on. But it, it, it is also something that, has to be negotiated here in the UK as well. Okay. Now, um, talking about Oluwale, uh, David Donka uh, actually asked a question on that and says, uh, he asked whether you engaged the story of David Oluwale through satire. And if so, how does one engage such a tragic narrative, at least if you see it as such, through satire? What considerations were important to you in such an engagement? Yeah, well, it's the only non-satirical uh, piece I've written. Um, there are funny moments in it, a few. And I remember one of the first reviews that came out said that there were surprisingly funny moments in it, but they would forgive it because the rest of the play was so dark, you know, and that they couldn't imagine how the actors could have got through the play without humor. And it's true because uh, in rehearsals, one of the actors who plays the one of the two policemen who were charged with his murder um, broke down. And one of the reasons why he broke down was because for a large part of the play, he, he spends most of the time uh, either uh, uh, beaten up or, yeah, or torturing David Oluwale. And uh, I think halfway through the rehearsal, we had to stop and uh, stop for an hour. And then everybody, we had to take a break and then come back. Um, so, I mean, I, I, when I think of it now, I, I almost wished that I, I had made it a bit funnier. And the reason why I say that is because um, it, it, it plays very much like a Shakespearean tragedy. And I, I late in, in hindsight, I, I thought I would have made it something that would have been a bit more with a harder edge uh, 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 that would have allowed people to see almost that a sense of alienation, that Brechtian alienation, 
to allow people to see above those sort of uh, uh, emotional moments. Uh, because I think the reaction to a lot of people was, was real deep sadness uh, when it should have been anger. Oh, thanks. Now, this, this next question, you actually have a lot of questions. This next question is from uh, Pepe Chamfobe. And uh, she asks, are you considering a play about the post-pandemic era? I, I think this must be too, for your uh, uh, revelation about contagion. And if so, what elements of satire might be of interest? Um, the funny thing, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of many theater so groups that have been discussing what to do after uh, post COVID if uh, a British theater industry still exists, given the fact that many venues are in trouble already and other venues are signaling that by the end of the year, if there is no uh, government, uh, extra government intervention, uh, they will close. Uh, others are thinking of new ways of creating uh, theater. So I think that my, my, my answer in short is that I think a lot of my colleagues will probably stone me if I write a play about COVID-19 because they're, 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 they're fed up, <laughs> they're fed up with it. They're, they're sort of fed up with it. Um, but I, I, I haven't, I guess it's to wait and see how this pandemic, uh, you know, how, how things uh, go. How it pans out. Yeah, how it pans out and then, and then we'll see, yeah. Okay, now um, there's a question, uh, well, a comment really from uh, Professor Sandra Richards, which is about, uh, well, first of all, I said, thank you for, the, for this talk. And so the question is a little bit outside this conversation because this is based on the idea of terms, terminologies and politics, uh, whether and uh, what they imply or what they may or may not imply. And it seems as if what we've been talking about, that our point of reference is actually contemporary Yoruba theater in one sense. However, all the references seems to be Yoruba, but the term used is Nigerian. Do, do you have any, any comment on that? Uh, well, um, I've, I, I consider myself uh, a, a, a yes, a Yoruba, and also a Nigerian. Um, I, and I, I, I take your point, but I, I, um, I remember the first time I went to Benin to start university. And on the streets, I kept hearing people talking about uh, it was time to run home to go and watch Aluwe. And I kept wondering, what, what are they talking about? And um, by that time, all the streets were cleared. Everybody was around the TV. And the reason why I was surprised was because the character Aluwe is a, a Yoruba comedy uh, 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 character. And I had only seen him in Yoruba language comedies, only. By the time, and then when I got, uh, when I went into the house to watch it, I realized that uh, the, the, the theater company, you know, had started adapting, uh, translating their comedies to Pidgin English. Um, and so there's a sense in which I, I, um, I, th I would say Nigerian-ness, uh, because it, it's also a plethora of, of, of different cultures. It's also a mix. It, we talk about, again, multiculturalism when we talk about the West, you know, it, it, but there's multiculturalism in, in, in Africa, in, 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 in Nigeria. Uh, and so um, I look upon it in those terms that, yes, those terms are interchangeable uh, in, in some circumstances and in other circumstances, uh, they're not. But I think it's also because a lot of my influences also came from living uh, in other parts of Nigeria as well, um, like studying for, living for four years in Benin, uh, doing my national service in, in Bida, which is sort of uh, uh, further up north, middle belt, yeah. the middle belt, middle belt region of Nigeria. Uh, so, um, I, yes, uh, I, I, I always feel that that, that that's sort of the the how um, that that's sort of how I choose to 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 see yeah, myself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's it's, it's difficult sometimes to to differentiate or to 
identify yourself with one particular part of Europe, uh, Nigeria, or the other, especially if if take coming from Lagos, for instance. Which Lagos is a, is a, a, a metropolitan a melting city. Pot. Yes, exactly. a melting pot. Yeah. So. And Benin too. I have to admit Benin. that Benin too is a massive melting pot as as, as well. Um, uh, but interestingly enough, my my last play, New Nigerians, did not have a single Yoruba character in it. They were all from other parts of Nigeria. Yes. Yes. Now, the, this this is a question which um, you may be interested in answering it's from Praise Praise Zeninga says, have you ever considered taking your productions to other African countries, such as South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Zambia, Uganda, with active and vibrant theater houses and festivals? I mean, we do know that the plays have been performed in Nigeria, Potakot's Book Fair, for instance, and so on. So have you considered taking your plays to festivals and I, theater I, houses? I have. Um, I mean, there, there was a production of the estate in, in Ghana uh, I think at the University of Legon, um, which uh, Dr. Awu Asiedu, one of our members, helped to facilitate. Uh, she is there. Okay, oh, that's great. Um, yes, uh, but yes, definitely. I've always uh, 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 wanted to, to have work um, performed more in Africa than anywhere else. Um, I've, I've actually been trying to get more work on in Nigeria uh, with a view also to working with companies uh, there to uh, to um, sort of uh, performing outside of Nigeria. Uh, so for instance, there was a company I worked with, the uh, Beta Universal, who took uh, the, the very first production of a monologue I wrote called Wait, and that went to a festival in South Africa. Um, so yes, I, I'm always looking out for opportunities. Um, it, it's interesting because we we sort of had a discussion within uh, after and we were uh, our organisation, and remember we were saying, Shola, we were saying how vibrant the theatre uh, is outside of Nigeria uh, in Africa, that they're more in the francophone nations. So yeah. yes, so it's definitely it's definitely something uh, I, I'm, no, I'm always on the lookout for that. And th th this is from Professor Perkins, Kathy, asking whether you have a play that deals specifically with the theme of home. You know, uh, I, I think the, what 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 we're talking about here is a play different from early morning, or different from the estate, but a play that deals with the notion of home from the perspective of the diaspora. Uh, no, I haven't. I, I don't have one that specifically uh, does. Um, that, but there are elements of that notion of home in, in different plays, including uh, the estate, where one of the, the, uh, both the sons uh, who uh, uh, work abroad, uh, both uh, making plans to return home. And they talk about their experiences in their respective stations outside of Nigeria. Uh, in the uh, hounding of David Oluwale, uh, David also, uh, the, the last line of the play is uh, him uh, meeting his mother and yeah. the refrain is, I, I, want, to I want to go home. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fed up of living here, I want to go home. Um, and it's the same again in Threshold. It, it, it's a recurring theme, but uh, they, I haven't written a, 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 a play specifically about uh, the notion of return. Mm. Yeah. Now, actually, th th this this next question from Nicolas Akas, we were actually uh, discussing about this a few days ago about uh, this uh, plethora of remakes in uh, Nollywood. You know, living in bondage, being remade, glamour yeah. girls being remade, and Efunshita uh, Nura being remade. And the the question is on comedy, and uh, Nicolas asked whether you know, as a satiric writer, how do you judge ideas of the present comic stories in Hollywood with that of the early 80s comic stories? Um, again, I mean, the, 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 I've only watched a few of the more contemporary uh, ones, uh, but the, the ones that I, I, I've seen again, I haven't, I, I would admit I haven't um, enjoyed them as much. I mean, I've enjoyed them, but not as much as the, the ones 
uh, back in, 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 in the 80s. I, I think there's a, a sense, a, a lot of them, uh, I think, are, are quite broad in a sense. And, and there's nothing so much wrong with them because a lot of them, again, they, they, they speak to a contemporary presence. But I think in terms of them at times, it feels as if they are talking to a, a, a a much smaller segment of the audience than in the 80s, where it felt there were it was a much wider uh, uh, audience that they they, they were talking to. Uh, quite a few of the comedies that I've seen are very much to do with um, very wealthy families, you know, uh, dealing with marriage and funerals and and, and so on. Um, but the ones I'd seen in the past, like oh, Sophia in London, and so uh, um, I, I just found them much more interesting in what they were doing and what they were trying to say. Um, so yeah. Now, what, what, which group of people would you say read? And I think this is from Fran Francisca and Wadigwe. And I think uh, read in this sense means the, the, the technical reading, you know, including dramatizing and uh, possibly even teaching. So what, which group of people will you say read your work more? Oh, um, to be honest, I, I have no idea. I really, and going, going I would say going by the, um, the statement, the, the book, the sales statement from my, I get from my publisher every year, I'd say maybe one or two people. Um, but um, I, I don't, I can't, I can't really, I can't really say, uh, I can't really say who 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 reads. I, I I remember when we did New Nigerians. All of a sudden, there's this university, a University of Reading students mm. turned up with a lecturer, and I was kind of wondering, like, well, you know, all the way from Reading, how did she? What well, you know? How did they find out? And it was actually because she had actually been reading my earlier plays, <laughs> and so she was like, "We're going on a trip. Oh God, he's got a new play out," and then you know, took brought her students with her. So you, you 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 never can tell. I I, I can never tell who's. Um, I I really don't know. Um, uh, but as I said, you know, if it's going going by my publisher or soon to be former publisher at this rate, I'd say <laughs> very few. Maybe, maybe this is maybe this is the time you should actually also say that your 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 plays are on the on the curriculum of Peking University. Oh I, well, I didn't know that. That's, that's why that's why I didn't say it. <laughs> I, I did, uh, I did this, now, th this is from Dan Dambiron, says that, um, I, I'm going to read it uh, as it's written, I, I'm struck by your good fortune in being able to locate yourself between at the crossroads and knowing your roots and being nourished by them. Do you also work with British, in quotes, British communities of Black youth and their communities who not only have no knowledge of their African origins, that is sleeping roots, yeah. but are even embarrassed by or dismissive and condemning of them. And how has uh, the Black Lives Matter impacted on such communities? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I have um, in, in a lot of uh, ways, I've done quite a lot of workshops. Um, for those of you who know London, you know, uh, Hackney is a predominantly black area. And I've worked with a theater center, which is a, a theater company uh, based uh, around that area on workshops with uh, young, with uh, a lot of young people. And uh, there's a truth to, to, to what you say in that question about uh, good fortune. I mean, I'd say, basically I'd say it's hard work really. And the fact that being a Nigerian, I never took no for an answer, you know, um, when, when, you know, venues would refuse to, to read or put on my work. But there is a sense of it. There was a there was a workshop I did, and I grew up in Hackney. I, I, I that's where I lived when I when when I was in England, and I remember doing a workshop in a school, and it was um one of those uh, failing schools, uh, which, which had massive disciplinary prob problems, and 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 I went in there. I was only supposed to talk to the class for half of the lesson, and it went on for the whole. The teacher allowed it to go on for the whole lesson. And I said to her, wow, that is, you know, these kids are really great. And she said, no, they're not. It's just, I don't know, they, they, but it's just that they were listening to you. They don't listen to me. And very few other people that come in, they don't listen to them. 
And to be honest, when I went into the classroom, I mean, I was terrified. You see all those young kids just looking at you like, what's this, what's this man? What's he, this guy with a funny name? What's he, what's he gonna, what's he gonna say to us? And so I kind of panicked. So I told her that I, um, I'm from Hackney. And they were like, no, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. No, nobody from Hackney talks like that. <laughs> and I said, I said, oh, I, I am, I am. And that's when they started to listen because they sort of realized that, you know, they'd only seen one way of the world or looking at the world. Hmm. And it was almost a sense, well, if he can do it, then I can do whatever I want to do. And that was sort of the, 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 the route that I, that I went down. Now, um, um... I'm, I'm going to be an enemy to, to about 17 people because I still have about 17 or 18 questions. So out of all that, I'm not even going to look at, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at those questions and send uh, responses afterwards. So I'm going to close by just asking one question, one final question from Xavier uh, Lopez. Well, I'm sorry to overrule you. Um, we can take two or three more questions. Um, oh. I know we kind of depressed for time, but yeah, let's yes. take two or three questions. And maybe yeah. you can encourage the court to keep uh, his answers, as, answers really short. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so okay. the question is, have any of your plays been translated into French? Uh, no. Oh. Next and question. have any of your have any of your plays been translated into Yoruba? Uh, sadly, no. And have they toured Nigeria? Uh, not 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 touring. No, no. Are They've you been to, performed are, in are certain you to places. change this? Are you going to collaborate with somebody a translator to translate to French or to Yoruba any moment anytime soon? Uh yes. When 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 I do have the time, translation is 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 a much tougher. Uh, this, think, this is actually be a reverse translation to Yoruba. Yes. For some I mean, Yes, that's right. I mean, uh, translators don't get the credit they deserve. I would argue, you know, in, in general, in, in the fact that they're what they do is allow work that is set in a local, uh, in a locality, to go global. Um, so, but it takes it takes a lot of work to to do. But definitely, I'm 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 up for. Any anybody wants to translate my work into any language, I'm I'm up for that. Okay. Right. Um. I'm I'm good. Just going to. Uh, I know there's still some other questions, but they'll take time. So I'm just going to round up by saying that this uh, conversation will be uh, published on our YouTube channel, as uh, the president said at the beginning. And this is in response to uh, Professor Lynette Goddard's question. You know, so it's going to be available to watch on YouTube. And uh, the link will be posted in this chat before we conclude. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Deepo, for this conversation. And I'm sure we're going to carry on and continue with this conversation uh, outside this forum. Thank you, everybody, and good evening. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shola Ademi. Thank you, Dr. Oladipo Agbolaje for such a wonderful conversation. I think um, if, uh, we're gonna uh, take 30 seconds for people that need to get some water, uh, maybe just get up and stretch your legs uh, to do that. But before we go, can we give a silent clap to uh, Dr. Oladipo and Dr. Shola? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few questions we couldn't get to. Um, I've posted the link to the video on our YouTube channel. Um, that's the live link, so I hope it's, it's going to be the same link afterwards. But if that link doesn't work, if you search for African Theatre Association on YouTube, you should be able to see the video in our um, public lectures folder. All right, so I'm just going to give me a minute. I'm going to pull up the video for us to watch. Uh, it's a 15-minute video clip about the African Women's Playwright Network, and um, please do enjoy it. Okay, so just give me a minute. And here we go. So you consider yourself a theatre goer. Have you ever seen a play written by an African woman? Why do you think that is?
2015, researchers at Warwick University began the African Women's Playwrights Network to connect African women playwrights with each other and with the world. Hi, my name is Pelisi Wetwenstra. I am a playwright, theatre director and actor from Durban, South Africa. My name is Uluato Sinkoshi Matsume. I'm a Nigerian playwright and theatre creator. Um, this is me, this is Neoki Bidizwe. I come all the way from Botswana, it's in Southern Africa. My name is Sophia Mempu Kwachu. Now these playwrights are being published and their plays are being performed for audiences around the globe. Look back at the history of Africa, the writers who were renowned at the time of the African writer, writer series, Ngugi wa Thiongo, Wali Soyinga, Shinua Achebe, were all male. And that's why it's women, because African Women Playwright Network is trying to close that gap and saying, yes, we have women storytellers or African women storytellers as well. Traitors! Traitors! These are the haters of their kind! They run away from their kind to join the enemy! I think for me, uh, the major ways in which the African Women Playwright Network has been helpful and supportive is um, one, building this network of African women theatre makers who I can uh, get suggestions from whenever I have challenges or celebrate a triumph with, but at the same time also um, exposing me to plays that I wouldn't have had access to and writers that I wouldn't, or women writers that I wouldn't have had access to if I were not a member. And the adulterer shall surely be put to <laughs> I don't believe ah was a part of the scripture. <laughs> Forgive me, first lady. It really does help a lot to encourage us, to push us, to make us continue with the journey and do the work that, it, that needs to be done, the work that is very important to do, because then otherwise, um, we we'll all just get lost in our little world and feel small and feel scared and feel like we're not making any difference. And then we don't have women's voices out there that our stories are then all told by men. What about us? What about us? What about us? <laughs> My play was put on in Cape Town in a sort of lo-fi production and Amy, who is part of African Women Playwright Network, um, got in touch with me and said, Sarah, could you send me your play? I'd like to consider it for this new anthology. Uh, so I did and that's how it got published. You should have made him masturbate. But that's not what happened. Who cares what actually happened? That was the scene, that was the moment where you grabbed the pencil and... I want to tell the truth. It's a fucking comic! No one cares about the truth. The network has been really beneficial to me. Being from Egypt, it's so hard to connect for, with people because it's such a closed place. And, and, and when you come from places which are quite... have quite intense regimes, quite closed off governments, which make it hard for people to come in, hard for people to move out. It's a joy to be able to, to know about what's going on in other parts of, of the continent, and I think the network's a big part of that for me. There's so much the African continent has to offer, and I feel it's important to know what's going on there, and I feel it's important to, know, to, to listen to women's voices, because, because we haven't for so long. A lot of the times people kind of go, where are the black women playwrights, theatre makers? Um, people like to do that just because the work is not visible as it should be all the time. And so I think what the network does is to make visible 
what people want to make invisible. In our parents' graves and ours, we grieve in spit. May the dead never wink at us in our coffins, nor haunt us while we are breathing. African Women's Playwright Network is the first platform that has published one of the works that I've written, which, as a South African, young South African black woman playwright, that's really rare. You know, a lot of us don't get published. Most of us don't get published at all. Jehovah Jireh, Jireh, the Lord who provides, provider. the Lord who sees, sees. water walker, walker. wine maker, <laughs> Jehovah nice, nice. I think the Jehovah world needs to see theatre from Africa because the image of African narratives has been distorted for a very long time and not been told by the people who are at the centre of that narrative. And so I think for the first time, people will who own those narratives can tell those narratives from their own voices. Theatre in Africa is brilliant and this is genuine. Look at you. You are a beauty. You just need to gain a bit of flesh. You go to the shops and parade your ass. Surely by tomorrow morning, you will be gone. And I will be sleeping in my brother's bed. The African Women Players Network Facebook page is very useful to me. Uh, it's just part of my life. I make sure that every day I have to go there and see what it, what is there, what other women in other places are doing, in other can, African countries are doing, to find out whether they, I can get opportunities. Because now and again, they post opportunities that you can either apply or learn from them. Especially in Africa, where there are no links at all compared to other. European countries where you found there are many networks that writers can meet and collaborate, but in Africa they are, it's rare. For me, if this network never existed, I, w I don't think I would have achieved all that I've achieved so far. The African Women Playwright Network just gave us a lifetime chance that will never had come by. It's a fact I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have my play published. The African Women Playwright Network connects you to the global world. It links you to, to um, theatre companies you, you never knew existed. It, um, it brings you closer to the real world of theatre making and it empowers you as an, as an African woman. After four years of this project where we started really struggling to access writers, to where we're now working with over 300 participants, people are saying to me, so how did you do this? And the answer is a combination of working with online platforms, mobile app, where we accessed women across the continent, asked them to join us, share their work, their ideas, their questions, their processes, and things that were getting in the way of their work. Then we facilitated face-to-face -face encounter at a symposium in Cape Town at the Arts Admin Collective, where people in embodied ways workshopped these questions that had come that we processed as researchers. And together in a reciprocal way, we worked through not only the questions, but potential solutions, which for me as a researcher was really interesting because things that came out were not what I expected, which suggested different ways of creating knowledge, a kind of co-creation of knowledge. And the women found trust and were able to collaborate in much more meaningful ways after the symposium. One of the best outcomes has been the collection of new plays by women from seven African countries. This work is really exciting because it's innovative, it's asking difficult questions, but in quirky and funny ways that is provocative, but also inclusive of really diverse audiences. And this has been exciting for researchers, but also for educators who can now access this new material. 
we've had organizations coming to us saying, how can we work with you? So the Canadian Guild of Playwrights have brought forward money to mentor writing. Theatres in South Africa are offering spaces to work with women to actually stage these plays. And so we're seeing a momentum to this work with these kinds of organizations saying, how can we roll out this network? At Pulling Buttonhole Theatre Company, we wanted to do a season that we were calling Outside Us, which was focused on non-American playwrights and non-American stories. Uh, we knew that we wanted to do a piece from a country or a continent that we didn't hear much from. And the more I explored the idea of doing African stories, the more I was really drawn to it. But there aren't a lot of resources um, out there to find African authors. I happened to find the African Women's Playwriting Network uh, Facebook page, and I put out a request uh, and had several really, really wonderful authors contact us and just fell in love with Adang Judas' work and with Tembe Moyo's work and decided that we needed to do an evening of one act so that we could showcase both women. There's a need for the African Women's Play Arts Network because it gives these incredibly talented women the exposure that they aren't getting through more traditional means, and it allows those of us who are looking for them to find them. And I got the call for submissions of plays by the AWPN and I sent in a play, you know, they were asking for plays that uh, specifically talk about uh, African women. I sent in a play titled, Not That Woman. And luckily for me, the play got uh, selected and was published. The African Women Playwright Network is such a huge project that is so, so creative, so encouraging, and has enhanced my professional career a lot. I had one of my plays, Bonganyi, published. Through AWPN, I was able to become a better writer. And what do I mean by that? That I'm no longer alone. I am connected to many, many, many creatives around the continent. When it comes to the African Women's Playwright Network, this has been such and a life-changing and even inspirational platform for me as a young woman and a young African woman because we need more platforms and we need more opportunities where we can connect as artists, where we can connect as women and just share our stories, share our struggles, share our rewards, not just to boost our careers or to boost our portfolios, but to also empower each other and empower the generation that is coming after us. Goa, is it now time for you to see a play written by an African woman? That's awesome, great. So thank you very much everyone for watching that. Um, I hope you will support this uh, work. And as, mu as much as we can from the African Theatre Association, we are committed to sub uh, supporting this, uh, this work with African Women Playwrights Network. Okay, I think that's the end of the video. Stop sharing. All right, so thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna stop the live streaming to YouTube now, and then uh, we're gonna open up the uh, chat and you can unmute yourself and say hello to people um, before we have to log off today. So once again, well done to our speakers today. Well done to everyone for your contribution. And for those of you, we couldn't get to all the questions that we asked, so please do, do forgive us. Um, we just want to make sure that we finished right on time as well. Uh, if you still want to get in touch with uh, Dr. Ladipo or Shola, 
please do uh, get in touch, uh, send the email to me and I will forward it to them or you can send it directly to Shola a treasurer at African theater, african-theater.org. We have our general, annual general meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, British uh, summertime. If you're an after member or would be after member and you want to be a part of that annual general meeting tomorrow, um, the uh, assistant general secretary Lazgo would have sent out invites already. But if you were not on the mailing list as of current members and you want to attend, send an email to Annette at, um, so send it to membership at african-theater.org and you will get the link, link sent to you so you can join us tomorrow. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, bye, keep safe and stay well. So feel free to unmute and have a chat with others. <laughs>